are live in Las Vegas, and I have the extreme honor to be podcast interviewing Dr. Dirk Dudek. Did I say your name right? Yeah, absolutely. I did. And you're from Berlin, Germany. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm from Germany. Oh, well, it's uh, such a treat. Most of the dentists listening to you are from the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, so it's a big treat to have one of the biggest implant gurus from Germany. This is a huge meeting in Vegas. They have, uh, I think, 1,200 people here. These are the elite implantologists, and you're speaking. I'm glad to, yeah. Yeah, and um, to get that speaking gig on this stage, I mean, I, I guarantee at least 100 implantologists were begging to speak, so <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> you, yeah. No, I'm serious. I mean, that, that is just a huge... At least they have to have a story, otherwise they wouldn't get any invitation. So you're, you're a DDS, you graduate 83 to 85, University of Constance, Bachelor of Science, uh, Dental School University, Berlin and Heidelberg, Department 92 to 2015, Department for Cranio Maxillofacial and Plastic Surgery, University of Heidelberg, Interdisciplinary Department of Oral Surgery and Implantology, University of Cologne, Germany. And by the way, I've been to Germany a dozen times. Cologne is my favorite. I understand. Oh my God. So if you, if you ever go to Germany, the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, its furthest outreach um, eastward was Cologne. And if you go to Cologne, it still has a, a remnants of the Roman Empire wall around it, but it's really neat because it's a mixture of uh, German and Italian yeah. cuisine. But what I like the most about Cologne is... The carnival season. The carnival season, yeah. <laughs> what I like the most about Cologne is when you get into too big of a city around the world, you know, you get lost. But Cologne is small enough to where when you're at the train or you're at the subway, they always understand that you're a tourist. And they always, even when they're this tall, trying to help you. Trying to help you get on the train, or are you? Lo I had one little girl said to me, "I said, are you lost?" And I said, "I'm trying to find this street." She said, "I'll walk you there." So I thought she walked me. She walked me like nine blocks. I'm like, gosh. I mean, it's just, it's just a quaint town. So what are you? Um, why are you speaking here? What are you speaking on? What are you most passionate about in implant dentistry today? Well, I try to cut a long story short. Um, I was actually asked. Um, to for, for a doctoral thesis uh, ten, more than 10 years ago. And um, the topic was the quality of dental implants um, with a look of a scanning electron microscope. So um, is there any differences in surface quality? And there was actually 11 years ago when I started the, the research, and I had no clue at that day that I opened with this topic, the box of Pandora. I say Pandora's box, whatever. So. Um, I found something I couldn't understand. As a young implantologist, I said, well, implants should be clean as they are sterile, and that I have to learn that I had to learn that sterile does not necessarily mean clean. And you can even sterilize particles that don't have to be in the body. So um, the setup of this study, I repeated it in the last 10 years at least four times. So in the fourth study, same setup, same protocol. And um, in comparison, that is what concerns me most of all is the number of really contaminated implants, implants with impurity is dramatically increasing instead of decreasing. So you think if everything goes better and better in industry, the, the, the protocol, the, the quality management, everything should be in the right order. But after 10 years in comparison, I'm more and more concerned. And this brought me to the idea that it's not enough to lecture and to write articles. As dentists, we have to to do something. And, and I always see the situation when a patient comes into my practice waiting room and um, she gets an appointment and then we have uh, this small talk, speak about the case, and it was never been asked from any patient, doctor, can I have an implant from the company ABCD? They always have a problem and they completely trust in my decision of what kind of implant system I will use for this case. So uh, when we ask the colleagues on which data, on which information is this decision based on, they have very rare information about the real quality of the product. They read a lot of advertisements, so the information is quite, um, it's always good if, if you want to sell something, a company loves to speak friendly for the product. And it's hard to find um, neutral, non-biased ana um, analysis from the scanning electron microscope. 
And this is what I do now for yeah, at least uh, more than 10 years. And I've seen up to 250 different implants from more than 150 different manufacturers. And there is no, unfortunately, no privilege for any country to produce an implant that, let's say, gives reason for concern or has room for improvement. I have to be very polite because sometimes I'm getting too passionate about this problem. We, we owe our patient um, the trust they, 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 they give us by the decision to enter our praxis. We owe them that we know and not just believe that a medical device, and this, in this topic, uh, a sterile dental implant is, first of all, as clean as promised and as good as promised. And what we see under the microscope is presumably beyond the imagination of the colleagues. So up to 25 to 30 percent of implants um, show impurities, some minor and some really um, interesting particles in this scanner electron microscope. We use a special technique. Um, I don't go too much into detail, but we we detect the backscattered electrons that are pro that produce an image not only about the topography, but also about the the elements on the on the in the sample. So we see that something with less electrons, like carbon or aluminum, shows us some black spots, and the titanium is light gray. And if we see some metal particles, and I could I've seen nearly half of the periodic system there. Um, tungsten, iron, nickel, chromium, they are um, quite shiny, they, they are quite bright. So I could identify there is something that is not the core material, and then we go into the spot analysis and we could um, see um, the elemental composition of it. So as these particles are not, there's no information on, on, the, on the packaging. I mean, imagine if you, <laughs> If you um, buy a box of cereals, or let's say it's a chocolate bar, and uh, you can always see some information may contain traces of nuts and peanuts, in case of some allergic patients. So we found, <laughs> I think we found more particles on some implants than simply, we actually no nuts and peanuts, but if we have something like um, uh, tungsten, like uh, chromium, nickel, stainless steel particles, organic contamination, remnants of um, PTFE, Teflon, they should declare it simply like on any chocolate bar. I mean, why is an implant less worth than a chocolate bar to warn patient and doctors and colleagues by using an implant if they have some, let's say, room for improvement? Um, they should be so honest to say, well, we have some problems, but no company will, will, do, will do so. So there is no privilege. We found wonderful implants from Korea. That's why we're here. <laughs> Megadon is one of the finest uh, I've seen so far in the microscope. And um, the big companies, let's say the bigger they are, they, they usually they have um, uh, a very good um, quality management. So they have control about the production process. They couldn't dare to have the problems we see in the, in the mid-size uh, companies. And we speak about at least um, there are numbers like 1,000 manufacturers worldwide, including the tiny North Italian um, garage fabrication site in every valley. Everyone has, a, has an uncle as a CNC machine. So honestly, the number might be about 400 implants with the- 400 implant companies? Yeah, I guess, yeah. But there's, worldwide. there's 400 just in Italy. Yeah, I mean, this, up, this sums up to a thousand. But honestly, there will be some. At least there will be some companies with uh, sharing the market no, up to ninety-five so, percent. So, so the why, majority. Why did, it, why did it take off in Italy so big? Because they already had a big titanium industry. That's a good guess. That's a good guess. At least um, implantology in, in Italy is quite um, um, famous because bella figura. People don't dare to have uh, uh, some problems on their tooth. If you have the same in, in the UK. Uh, missing tooth is not that a, a social problem than in Italy. Nobody would dare to to show that. Well, like if, one thing. if you buy any um, anything around the world, like uh, what are the tennis racket made out of? The uh, carbon carbon fibers. And with that material, it's like the the whole industry is in Taiwan. We're, I see. I see. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, no. The, uh, I, I don't think Italy is the, is the center of of uh, titanium industry. I don't think so. Because you don't think uh, it's amazing. Because there's like there's, you think there's one thousand different 
dental implant manufacturers yeah, in just Italy? They, they're just uh, sharing a very small portion of the market. Right. We can always concentrate so on the big ones. So you said there's 400 big ones? Yes, a ma major four, four, one. Major one. Up to, nobody has the real number because they come right. and go every day. We see some. But, so how many, how many of them do you think are, are so it's too big to be dirty? Uh, <laughs> that's a good, a good question. Um, I think there's a pattern. If they have, um, let's say, the big five, the big four. And who are the big five in your mind? Uh, the blue, the green. <laughs> the blue, the green. <laughs> the red. <laughs> so we could think about uh, um, Strawman, might be the market leader, then we have Nobel, Biocare. So Strawman sells the most, mainly through acquisitions. I mean, they bought Biodent and... Um, Brazil, yeah, a lot of companies. Yeah. in Israel. New Dent in Brazil, yeah. So um, Strawman, Noble. Noble, we have uh, um, Densply with Astra and the acquisitions like um, MIS is a big one uh, as, as part of Densply now. MIS, MIS. Uh, make it simple out of Israel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think Zimmer is number four, but I don't have the exact numbers. So. And Zimmer is, uh, they put their dental implant division up for sale. Uh, it's not the only one, I guess. <laughs> That's for sale? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of um, rumor and changes in the market, so it's, it's hard yeah. to... F My problem as, but, a, but, as a researcher but, is always to address people who I can speak to. So if a company uh, is in this, is this situation of, of uh, acquisition, you always lose your, your contact partner. So this is a, is a mess if you just have a, have a nice guy to you speak to, you have some trust, build up some trust, and then everything changes every two or two, three years. But would you say the, those five are clean pretty compared to the other 400? Strom and No Biocare, Densply, Astra, MIS, uh, Zimmer, Megagen? Um, there is a pattern, yeah. I think um, they are too big to fail. The reason is if we have these findings, I, I can f uh, regular find in the scanning electron microscope on an implant that is uh, on the, that says on the um, stock exchange. A story about let's say a lack of quality management would have such a huge impact in their shares that they um, they just care for the product they have to and they have the the power they have the the money for it and because quality is nothing you get for granted you, it's, it's always a part of the price you pay for an implant and if you see um, I was sometimes asked what is the cheapest implant I found on the market do you have a good guess? What is the cheap? How, how, how less you can? Forty-nine dollars. Forty-nine. Less. Even less. less. Yeah, less. Wow, how cheap? It's about uh, the one I found is uh, fifty-four, forty-five Brazilian real. That sums up to fifteen dollars. One five. Fifteen dollars. Was it made in Brazil? They are right packaged and uh, an external hack. So you have the price range from let's say at least fifteen or twelve dollars up to four hundred dollars. And usually the, the, the quite expensive ones, usually you have the information that there is a good quality management. They can't dare to have these, um, these problems in the manufacturing. Well, I want to I wanna stop you right there. Um, one of the, the largest dental company in the world is really Danaher. Um, Danaher yeah. And they're spinning off their dental division. The, the parent company is going to own the dental division. But they're going to separate it from their medical deals. But then there is no Nobel, right? They bought Nobel. Yeah, they bought no. That that was my question. So they bought Nobel, which is their pre expensive premium, and then they bought Implants Direct, which is their um, their value play. And you're talking to a bunch of dentists out there. Um, is it worth it to pay twice as much money for a Nobel than half the price for an Implant Direct? How do how do you wrap your mind around the value? I mean, you were talking earlier about you found an implant for $15. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, so how does a dentist draw the line between, I want to do what's best for my patient, so I buy the expensive Nobel, can I buy the value implant um, direct, can I buy a $15, um, where does Megagen fit in? There, all this? There, there is surely a threshold where you can't expect um, so if you, if you pay with peanuts, you can't expect, you can only expect monkeys. So if you pay too less, <laughs> if you pay too less, um, there's no, you should, you should not wonder that the implant has some um, um, uh, less better quality or some impurities. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm typing down that quote. I've never, it must be a German quote. I've never heard of it. If you pay with peanuts, uh, only expect a monkey. What do you say if you pay with peanuts? You only get monkeys or, or track monkeys, whatever. So, um, 
this is um, a question I was, um, after every lecture, people ask me um, how less we can spend. I mean, in the end, it's always, if you choose a system, I've made implants for more than, uh, at least about 20 years, and if you choose a system, it's, it's not only, let's say, simply the implant surface. The quality of an implant is probably um, a lot more. It, it starts with the, the, um, how they treat you, how the time of deliver, if in case you need any parts, is the, does it need a week or does it need 20, 20 hours to have new parts? So the complete, let's say the surface component you have, you have the, it has to be, if you are fine with the system, and you have good results in your practice. Sometimes it's easier to, to don't change a, a running or a winning system. Um, and to go to the cheapest implant, um, I think the decision is, is always a problem. If you watch, for example, some, if you're on Moscow or on, on these cities, on these exhibitions, you can see the crowd coming to the booth of the companies. And you can just listen to the question of these guys. It's not only a Russian problem, it's in, in, it was a worldwide thing, but it's dramatically how, the, how concentrated the, the colleagues are on the price. The first question is, what is the price for an implant if I order 15, 100, or 1,000 uh, uh, samples? Um, they, the first question should be, how good is the implant? What is the evidence? Do you have clinical documentation over a long period? So is there, um, is, it, is it from the um, clinical um, point of view a good implant? And not only from the price, because in comparison to the complete price for the treatment, an implant is just a tiny part. So why not such a big deal about five or ten dollars more or less? I wonder why um, there are some colleagues that um, uh, buy a copycat and charge the real one. Um, there are some countries who do s uh, this is still a problem that is addressed to the EAO, the European Association of um, uh, also integration. Now your your website is cleanimplant.com, yeah. um, and you um, you run a nonprofit. You basically uh, you're the managing director of the Clean Implant yeah. Foundation, okay. a nonprofit organization that conducts the largest periodical quality assessment in implant dentistry and awards the globally accepted trusted quality mark for dental implants. I wish you would go on Dental Town. Um, it has um, 50 categories, and one is implantology. Yeah. I wish you would go on there and post about this so all the Americans could um, learn more about your deal, but yeah. what, what are they going to find if they go to cleanimplant.com? They will find the complete story, how we started, what is the problem, who is supporting us, protecting us, so uh, what is the, um, let's say, the system, how we dare to decide what is a clean implant worth to be awarded with a quality mark. So I was, I gave a lecture in San Diego a few years ago on the ICOI Congress, and um, after the lecture I was cr crowded by more than, uh, they st stood around me and like uh, uh, 20 people just, uh, it was a big up rumor after the lecture, and they're just shouting names. I just thought they were just asking for my business card. At least they dropped names from the third row from behind. Dr. Duda, can we still trust company, blah, blah, blah. So just by dropping names, I thought about, well, these guys wanna, don't care about the system. They just go, it's all about trust, trusting a manufacturer. After the lecture, this trust was, let's say, um, they have more questions than answers. And I thought about, we have to find a, it's not me who decides about whether it's a good or nice implant or a clean implant. We have to find a system and it's an, as a non-biased, um, peer-reviewed analysis. So this is when we started the long journey of how can we produce data that are so delicate. I mean, we have, I will speak later about the problems, um, how to solve no, this, the, the strategy is how to solve the problem of a contaminated implant. Uh, ironically, there's some nice tries even to threat us with legal action to zip our mouth. How, how long is this video on your website? One minute and 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, Actually, there's a lot of nice images of these findings. Yeah, why don't we, um, can I insert that video right now? So standing in front of the German Reichstag, uh, where our government is uh, hosted, I would like to talk about regulation. We have in Europe a good system that 
improves the quality of medical devices. Notified bodies, they do the job in looking for uh, the process quality of a manufacturing side of an implant. So the problem we have, although we have all these authorities, in the US it's the FDA, in Europe it's the CE authorities, in Brussels, and notified bodies doing the job. We have, unfortunately, a lot of implants that pass all these processes and they get a certificate and under the microscope we found so many contaminants on some implants that obviously we have no control. Now, the Clean Implant Foundation will have a global quality seal and we will work for better quality uh, that every implantologist all over the world will know, not believe, that his implant is clean. So we started actually with the question, what is a clean implant? And um, I had the data about 250 implants um, already at that date. Uh, it was last year. And I um, collected all the information and made a proposal. So is this ended in a consensus paper, in a, a peer review with Thomas Albrechtson, Anne Vanderberg, um, Michael Norton, maybe well known here, Scott Gans, and all the other guys, um, our scientific advisory board. So the, this, the decision for the threshold was not made by me. I just made the proposal, but we had six signatures under the consensus paper that defines um, what could be um, expected if you pay more than $15 for an implant, and what are these findings we should not or never um, ex accept. Uh, on a sterile device that should last for a lifetime in the bone of our patients who trust us for the decision. So coming to this point, we, well, first of all, we found how, how, how many particles would be still acceptable. It's very hard to find an implant with zero particles on it, very, very hard. Only a few companies can deliver these. And um, we thought about um, up to 10 particles less than 50 micron um, we have a lot of implants um, in this range. And then we have a huge bunch of implants that had even much more systematic contaminations, complete plaques, the complete shoulder is, is full with something. We can only measure <coughs> that is organic contamination. We don't have the information if it's either polyethylene or if it's Teflon or whatever. So um, then we thought about how can we produce data on a level that we are not going to be sued for every decision. I mean, because it's so delicate. We speak about a billion dollar market, and there's this institute from Germany who just goes there, thumbs up, thumbs down. So how could they dare? And it's, we actually we saw the reaction from the industry already. The friends, like companies who have who produce fine implants, they love our job, and the companies who have. I say room for improvement, they, room for improvement. they don't love us. I can have other words for this, but it's more polite to say room for improvement. So then we decided to um, have the complete setup um, in five steps, and this is important. We select five implants for the scanning electron microscope, three implants always we order from the companies, X Factory, and two randomly by colleagues from the same, nearly the same batch, plus minus three months. So we can, is that we don't compare apples and oranges, but always implants from the same type and approximately the same production period. And all these five implants have to match the consensus paper decision, what is a clean. So we never ex um, accept like particles of copper, chromium, nickel, tungsten, any metal that is not the core material. And no huge plaques, no huge areas of organic contamination. And the other thing is after we um, um, received the samples, we, it's ridiculous. We, we, I had to invest another 50,000 euro in it in a clean room environment for this 20 seconds of unpacking the implants and to, for the transfer in the scanning electron microscope vacuum. Because I received an email from the US company, Dr. Dudek, interesting, thank you for the information of the findings. How long does it take from unpacking the implant to your microscope? Uh, it's saying in between the lines, do we have time to spit on the implant or just pick it up from the ground and then put it in? So to get rid of the accusation that there must be some, there is something on the implant. I invested another 50,000 in a clean room class five environment. 
So the complete microscope now is in, is in a laminar flow uh, area. So we have Where do you get that money if you're a nonprofit? Um, at least I'm all in. I, my I invested more than 250,000 euros. Of your own money? I'm all in, yeah. Wow. So this is your passion. Let me, when, oh, when, okay. wait, let me just finish it. Let me just a five step because it's so important that the colleagues understand that we are not um, just tumbling the dice. We just have a very um, uh, straight uh, process of um, the protocol of the analysis. This is so important even because we have to defend all accu um, accusations that, oh, Dr. Dudek, you, they pay you something and then they get a good result. There's no chance. So after collecting these five, unpacking in a clean room environment, we always have an, an, a special image that takes about one hour. We're collecting up to 400 single SEM frames that are electronically stitched together to one huge Im uh, image that shows the complete implant, at least in an angle of view of 120 degree what is just lying flat there. And so we, we have no chance to cherry pick nice areas. You will always find, even on the 15 euro implant from Brazil, you will find a nice looking area with zero particles. But this is not the complete implant, the bone will see. So we see always the complete implant, this is number four. And then we produce the, um, the, 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 the decision paper as a recommendation, and then, it, and then I'm out. I, uh, two um, members of the scientific advisory board, Again, it's Thomas Albrechtson, Anna Berg, Hugo de Bruyne from, from uh, Belgium, um, Louis Can Luigi Canula from Italy, Jaffa Mouhi from Morocco. So internationally, renowned dentists and professors for the reputation. That it's, we can speak about these guys, the motivation of these guys. Two randomly selected in a peer, re peer, re peer review process, they decide this is, fits everything together and this is meets the criteria and then they uh, award the implant with the trusted quality mark. So this is a process we have to be double, triple, five times safe that this is an unbiased acquisition of data and uh, otherwise I have always accusation as actually some nice and funny, ridiculous, uh, brutal uh, and aggressive reactions all, all the way up um, like for example, um, one uh, CEO, I mean, thinking that I'm, our job is disturbing the business is one thing, writing me that it's obviously that I had different sources of light to, to produce shadow in the image to uh, have it a bad outcome. I, said, I, I have to read it three times. And I just checked the manual of the scanning electron microscope. There is no light in the room. There is no way to produce shadow. And another one is the CEO from Switzerland. They are, they are not idiots, but they're writing me. <laughs> so I have evidence in an email. <laughs> they're writing me stories like, well, it's obviously that you have melt. OK, the implant is dirty. We have some, some, some uh, points of, of carbon. It's obviously you melted the titanium with the electron beam of the microscope. Again, I have to read it three times. <coughs> this is, are you saying the American BS? This is to totally stupid nonsense. I mean, there's no, <laughs> no idea too, too stupid to explain uh, why these particles are on the implant. It's simply a lack of quality management. And, and, and again, if, 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 it's, if it's $50 or if it's $400, we should ex uh, expect that the implant is as good as technically possible. And um, we see implants on the market that they, they can produce an implant with zero to very minor um, contaminations or particles. And this is the level we, we should um, raise the bar. And, and this is what, to fulfill the promise of the patient who's sitting there with a the problem, trusting in my decision for implant system, it should be a good implant, as good as technically possible. And not just believing or just using, choosing an implant because I get an extra iPad if I order 500 implants. Like, in some countries still. Not in Europe, not in the US, but there are still some strange decision-making processes in the world. But it's, it always falls down to the one situation. If you work for 20 years in a university, you always get the patient that lost trust in doctors around the university area. You're the last address. Dr. Dudek, you're in the university, you're working in the private office of Professor uh, uh, in, in Cologne, you find the solution. And I could see the disappointed, complaining patient. They lost not only trust in the dentist, they actually lost trust in implantology because there was so many things went wrong. And you could see this 
human beings, we not speak about statistical numbers. We don't speak about tests and beagle dogs or, or guinea pigs. If they say we have 95% success, wonderful. I see five complaining patients, crying ladies, wasting my time in my office. I mean, at least it's our job in university to speak with them. But we see five people who have a loss of an implant. And we have the, t the technician complaining about the cost, who pays for it, what went wrong. Is it just always the, you can't always blame the technician or blame the patient uh, for not brushing their teeth or for a low standard dental hygiene. You can't blame the industry as always. It's, it's, it's always a mixture of, of, of factors that leads to a loss of bone. And this is so important that in the end, if we have one tiny problem, I know it's just a tiny part of the chain of quality and success, implants, implant success, success. Um, this should not open a new problem. As, as we are treating implants always, let's say, with, even with patients with um, uh, radiation before in the university, all these cases, the colleagues from the private practice, they go with the pay, come to with the patient, say, please treat this patient. He has a bleeding disease or whatever. So you go always to the limit. This is what universities are for. And the last problem you want to have is another additional, let's say, extra load of foreign bodies. And to, to end the story about this foreign body thing is, if people ask me, how many particles are acceptable for the body? I say, well, I asked the same questions to Thomas Albrechtson. And he wrote a nice article about ending in the theory of the foreign body equilibrium. This is the reason why the former chancellor of Germany he died years ago, and he smoked about three packages of cigarettes. He didn't die of, of lung cancer. And you have another colleague, a patient, who smokes just two cigarettes a day, and they get, they get a uh, carcinoma. So uh, there is an individual foreign body equilibrium in every patient. That's the reason why one, you may probably take a rusty nail, and some patients can live with it. If it's sterile, <laughs> it's better you have a sterile implant and not a rusty nail. But, um, if you have the chance to produce an implant with uh, zero to minor, very minor particles, you should um, have this implant and not deal with an extra problem. And in the follow-up, and this is interesting to understand because people telling me always, um, well, is it really that danger? My, I never have a patient that died of an implant. I say, yeah, lucky you, but they were complaining. The in, in loss of an implant is a drama for a patient. It's a statistical number for, for, for scientists, but um, if we see um, a foreign body, whatever it is, on the implant, it's so important to understand that all the particles you will see in the video, um, they lose probably contact due to the high friction forces in the moment of inversion of the implant. So we always have a concentration of all these particles, even if it's metal particles like bronze particles I found, or uh, copper, chromium, nickel, uh, some, some tungsten, stainless steel particles um, on the dense cortical bone. So there it starts a foreign body reaction as an answer for a foreign body. This is, you can read it in the first semester in the university, the, the way biology is reacting to foreign bodies. And unfortunately in the follow-up of foreign, the foreign body reaction, we always have an increase of osteoclaster and osteoclastogenesis. That means the body is quite stupid to get, it's a stupid cleaning woman, to get rid of the problem of, let's say, some particles at the, at the cortical bone, where you want to have the best uh, seal with the bone, at least don't want to have perimplantitis. Um, the body helps to get rid of these particles by taking away the bone, so osteoclast increase. It's like my cleaning, if I ask my cleaning woman to get rid of, a, of some red wine on the carpet, okay, doctor, when you come home, the red wine is, is gone. And she takes a knife and just cuts it out. I said, well, that, you, you ruined the carpet. I mean, like you asked for the, for the red wine. So the body is working the same by, by getting rid of these particles to macrophages. They got, they got help from osteoclast. So then I speak about, in my lecture about the domino theory. It starts with the contamination, let's say, with a foreign body, an avoidable foreign body, by the way. Um, then we have the foreign body reaction. We have the increase of osteoclast. We have, let's say, a loss of bone, just one or two millimeters, not even more. But then we have a rough surface of the implant, free to the saliva, to, 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 to biology. And then we have um, bacteria. 
And with butyria, we have infection, we have a peri-implant mucositis, we have probably a peri-implantitis and probably more loss of bone that ends in the end, like domino stones, one after the other ends in the loss of an implant and a crying, complaining patient. So this is the story we have to speak about. You notice that when some people wear um, fake jewelry, they'll get a tattooing a green around their skin. And some people won't. And I, I've noticed in 30 years that um, dark-skinned people, um, um, Hispanics, American Indians, African Americans, they don't get that. But Northern Europeans, um, English, Scandinavia, they, they'll get that green tattooing around there. And some dentists are making that analogy that titanium implants um, aren't as inert as everybody thinks they are. And, that, and they're starting to say that um, you should go to ceramic implants. But it sounds like you might be saying that maybe it's not the titanium at all. Maybe it's that there's all these impurities that uh, aren't supposed to be. So, so mm -hmm. saying all that, what, what does that make you think? Do you, do you think there's gonna be a push towards ceramic implants so that people don't have reactions to titanium? Or are you saying more that it's not the titanium it's that they're, they're dirty with all these other things that you're talking about. They're very, very rare cases. Um, if you look on the scientific evidence level, who speaks about uh, um, reactions on titanium particles, you will find them in the bone for sure, uh, up to the next one or two centimeters, be uh, right beneath the, the, the insertion. But, um, we have the same topic with aluminum oxide remnants on the blasting process. I don't, it's my personal opinion. It's not evidence-based. I don't think that any patient gets Alzheimer's disease because of there are some remnants of aluminum particles on the bone. I'm actually more concerned about, because we know there's, from the statistical point, um, I asked Anne Vanderberg and Miami of the days, is aluminum remnant really a problem? For Just to pick up one thing, and she said, no, we don't have any differences in osteointegration and removing and removal torque, so the friction force you need to, the force you need to, to, to unscrew an implant and the, the level of um, um, bone to implant contact, there's no, um, not, such, not such a huge impact on, on aluminum oxide but we sure see some reactions on, on the higher load of um, um, organic particles. But you mentioned one thing, it's um, tattoo or tattoo-like colors. Um, we have, um, in, in, in Germany we work uh, also together with the, the Fraunhofer Institute and they make a lot of research. One is this in the, in the CERN, it's a huge, uh, how do you explain, um, uh, area in, in, in Geneva uh, to test the tiny, tiny, tiny parts of the body. And they made a research and they found, first of all, they identified the colors of tattoo. It's all metal. Every color in a tattoo is a metal, tiny metal and the nanoparticles. And they could find all these nanoparticles in the lymph node of dead patients who had a tattoo. So the corresponding color, they found the corresponding metal particles inside the lymph nodes, and not in one, in many of them. If I see these particles, like some interesting uh, uh, particles containing copper and tin, I have to go to my chemistry box from late from the school time. And what is copper and tin? It's bronze. And I ask, where the heck is bronze? What comes bronze on an implant? It's going like, like an uh, uh, FBI analysis for better implants, by the way. <laughs> um, and then we found out that the, the nozzle from the blasting is made of bronze. So the, in the in fabrication side, so some bronze particles come to the implant and stick on the implant, and um, this will have an impact. Nobody can tell me that um, this particle, best case, will be washed away, but if it's part of the body, it will be taken up by macrophages. The problem is, by the way, not that these particles are so, sm uh, so small or so big. The problem is if they are smaller than eight micron. So even, I am interested in these small particles. They can, they are ready for macrophages. They can take it up. And then I, the next question is where do they go? I don't want to answer this question because I don't have no clue about this. And the colleagues ask me after lecture, Dr. Dudek, how important is this and this and this? I say, okay, it's so coming down from a statistical, scientific-based question to, let's say, to ethic, to medical ethic, ethics. And then I just say, well, you have the choice. Let's say it's Sunday evening and you hear a loud noise 
some uh, your son, your mother, your your wife uh, uh, is just falling down the stairways, and you see oh something happened. She's crying and oh a lot of noise, and you go down there and you see well your son, your mother is losing his center, his center incisor. Okay, see what? Well, okay, this is a no chance. We need an immediate implantation. It's Sunday evening. You give a call to your team and uh, say, Lisa, we don't start at 9. We start at 7 in the morning. First patient is my son, my mother, my wife, people I really care for. And you have two systems in your, in your stock. One is the 15 euro system, or even if, uh, a system where you say, well, it's so cheap, we got a good price. And, and the other one is one of the implants where you know from research and from the quality mark that is, uh, that is a fine implant. What is the choice of the implant for your son, for your mother, for people you really care for? And why not for every patient? So coming, if you have the chance to use a medical device with no question mark, at least we are reducing question marks. Um, I don't go too deep into the discussion how many particles of, of stainless steel will have an impact. It's avoidable. It's that easy. My message is so plain and simple. Industry is able to produce it. And the dentist should pay a little more for this quality management by, by forcing the industry to lower and lower prices. You get what you paid for. So there is a threshold, I don't know, between, good guess, $100, $50. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a price where you can't um, guarantee a quality mark that is good for a medical device. That's all about it. And you find the complete story on the website. Yeah, I love your quote from Winston Churchill on their website. It says, criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fulfills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to the development of an unhealthy state of things. And if you go to your website, <clears throat> the first picture on there, what, what, am, what are we looking at there? This is a remnant of a huge remnant, about more than 500 microns. Um, in the polished part of an, of an implant in the, in the shoulder, and you see some black um, organic material, and the tiny white particles, I had to check this three times, it's antimony. And I have to check where this, the heck is antimony coming from, I have no idea. Antimony is something you can measure if there's gun shooting areas, it's part of the, the gunpowder, and it's toxic. I mean, there's a story from Berlin where they had Berlin police had a huge numbers of people who uh, um, went ill. And uh, so they have a very high rate of, of people who, who are complaining. And finally, they found out that the air condition in the shooting area where they train it was, was a defect. So it comes down to the antimony level in their, in their blood. So this is probably something that is not good. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know the reaction, but again, um, we found bronze, we found copper, chromium, iron, tungsten, um, so a lot of metals, and I'm actually more concerned about this masses of um, uh, organic contaminants, and they work on an implant, and whatever stage from production or handling, these particles come to the implant, they work like chewing gum on the pedestrian. They collect all these like, little stones on the, you see you're chewing on the pedestrian, you see some stones inside the chewing gum, right? And the same act, the same as um, with some, it works like glue on an implant. It's hard to get rid of these particles during the, 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 the process of uh, cleaning. And you see all the stuff that is during, occurring during this, this process. So um, where do you live in Germany now? In Berlin. You live in Berlin? In Berlin. And were you able to fly nonstop Berlin to Las Vegas? That was an 11 hour flight, yeah. Nonstop? Nonstop. To Vegas. Good time to work there. Nice, yeah. 11 hours. <laughs> I to, it's always. I to prepare my lecture. It's always yeah. the greatest nonstop. I remember the most yeah. brutal lecture I ever gave was in um, <laughs> Cambodia. And from the time I left the airport to got to the hotel was 36 hours. Jesus Christ. That's how many hours. I and I took, you. and I thank God I took three of my four boys with me because they got an appreciation for dad because they were just, That's good. they were just dead zombies. And like, dad, I don't know how you do yeah. this. And I'm like, yeah, how would you like to do it at I, my age? I just owe you one question. You um, owe, uh, ask for, for zirconia implants, ceramic implants. It's important. Um, if it's ceramic implants, um, they have a history of, of failures in the beginning, in the early beginning, and this is kind of um, 
lots of colleagues are blaming ceramic implants. They're not as good as, but they will be better every year. And we see an increase. Every big company is now if actually uh, producing a new one, uh, developing a new one, or just buying a system. Right. So some mixtures. And th they are usually for patients that really care so much for their, they have actually allergic uh, history and and it looks like a ceramic implant is the solution with zero uh, reaction on the body. We know it's nice to, to the gingiva and um, they work pretty fine, but we have, this is just because they are white, they're not necessarily cleaner than the other. They have a different process. Um, the sintering process with very high temperature, they burn away every organic material, but then you have to package them, you have to touch them. And we still find a um, high number of ceramic implants with organic contaminations, avoidable contamination. We found other ones with the zero, so again here, same problem. We have to address the industry for the same care of quality management as we have, as we force the industry to have for uh, titanium-made implants. And then you also have the, the the market because like the scientists that I read say that 90% um, of the people on a gluten-free diet have no scientific reason to be on yeah. a gluten-free diet. Yeah. And there's just a lot of dentists and a lot of patients who don't want metal. Exactly, metal-free metal free implants. And that's what they believe, that's the market. It's and any chance we, the, you're, right. you, the reviews of your lecture are just amazing. Do you think there's any way you'd ever put that course on Dentaltown? I promise. You I promise? Will. I will. Oh my gosh, it would just be an honor. Any, anytime you want to put an online C course on Dentaltown. It would be my pleasure. Um, it was just an honor to, for you to fly 11 hours, <laughs> and I caught him here. We're both lecturing at Megagen, and um, to catch you here, thank you so much for taking the time to come by and talk. Thanks for having me again. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You.